Take it live at five. Getting your kicks on Route 66. Well, oh. greetings and salutations, test takers. Uh, Merry Christmas. It's the Christmas season, I think, officially. And uh, I am Dean Tenney, a.k.a. also known as the Series 7 Guru. We have our always a very special guest, the test geek himself, Brian Lee, managing member, test geek exam prep, LLC. We have these every Tuesday. The purpose is to share uh, what we hope is test content with you. Uh, you know, if you have questions about any FINRA or NASA exam, I don't know. What do you think, Brian? Six, seven decades of experience here. <laughs> if, we can't answer, if we can't answer the question, we'll certainly tell you. But if we probably can answer the question, that probably means it's not on the test would be, uh, I guess, my cop out. <laughs> we answer questions on any FINRA and NASA exam you may have. And then we're also fun and fellowship. Uh, other people are contributing uh, to the uh, live stream. Uh, could you tell us, uh, like I say, do it every week. Tell us where you're uh, joining us from. I see Marcel is already in the house from Kenner, Louisiana. So what series exam are you taking and where are you joining us from? I don't think, Brian, on the YouTube channel, I have international viewers, but I don't think we've had any international folks in our live stream yet. We'll have to come with some kind of a little booby prize or something if we get somebody from India or the UK or, you know, wherever the case uh, may be. Uh, I have been, we'll do some housekeeping and get right to your questions. In terms of housekeeping, uh, the test geek and the guru, we've been collaborating on a series 66 podcast series. We're on episode three. You can find those on Spotify. You can also find them on my YouTube channel. I think Brian is also loading them to his YouTube channel. So uh, they are available. We're trying to keep a pace of about once a week. If we can keep that pace, that means our next episode will be out uh, next week at some point. I'm also doing an SIE podcast. And I put up an episode on capital markets. Uh, the next episode will be economics and types of offerings. And that will be out uh, hopefully uh, next week as well. Uh, Brian has been kind enough. I think the two best paid supplements, the two best paid supplements. My YouTube channel is a free supplement. Hey, you know, very popular price point, free. Uh, but if you're looking for a paid supplement, uh, I highly recommend a Kaplan QBank. There is no better QBank in the business than the Kaplan QBank. I've been trying to get Brian to write his own QBank, and he says why when there's already QBanks out there. And then if you combine that with uh, Brian's uh, food supplement, his Test Geek supplements, uh, he has been kind enough to give our viewers a 20% discount. So 15% on Kaplan products is Guru 15. By the way, that's just not QBanks. Anything you want from Kaplan, you can get 15% off. And uh, Brian, the discount code is 20 bucks. Uh, he has various tiers to his offerings. These all in is his video series on whatever series exam you're taking and then you know if you want to buy the pdf for class notes or the practice exam you can do that separately i think it's a hundred dollars until new, new, next year i think you're going up in price so it's January, all January. In, uh, brian uh if you're using the channel the best way to use my channel is to go find your playlist sie series seven and then if that's what you want to do you can binge uh, sie we have three playlists uh, they're in suggested watch order. The videos are in suggested watch order. If you're trying to find a particular topic, go to the channel search bar and put in margin. You know, I got somebody the other day. Do you have something on margin? I go, oh, my God, if you put margin in the channel search bar, you'll 40 things will come up for you. So if you're looking for a particular topic, that's the way to do it. At the end of each of our sessions, we do a drawing for a 30-minute uh, coaching call. You need to claim that within one hour. I don't think, I apologize if I am, I think I delivered to Rachel her coaching call, which was gifted to her by the last winter. But if uh, you have fallen through the cracks and you want a coaching call, I owe it to you. Do again, send me an email, say, hey, Dean, you know, what's the, what's up? I think I'm current on coaching calls, but uh, you know, if I, I'll stand corrected if you, uh, you know, call me out. All right. So let's get started on content and other things. Now yeah, let's see what we got going on. Uh, let's see. How do you log in? You don't need to log in, Cheryl. I hope you're there. Uh, you should be, you know, there's no login necessary to join us on the live stream. Uh, we broadcast to Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube, and X, formerly known as Twitter. Uh, our preferred platform is uh, YouTube, but uh, you can find us live every Tuesday on those three platforms. 
All right, let's see. Catherine Hawkins, I just watched your explicate, explicated Kaplan Series 6 practice test. Mm -hmm. If the customer is looking for preservation of capital, why would the answer be money markets and not treasury bonds? I'll answer and ask uh, Catherine to Brian over again. Treasury bonds have interest rate risk. You know, ask the Mormon church. They lost hundreds of millions of dollars in what they thought was a conservative treasury bond portfolio because interest rates went up, causing the bonds to go down. Money markets uh, don't have interest rate risk because the underlying security in them, commercial paper, bankers' acceptances, T-bills, whatever today's rate is, that's what you would be getting. So that would be my answer. That uh, Treasury bonds have interest rate risk. They certainly don't have credit risk, but they have interest rate risk. Brian, what do you think? Yeah, that's Kaplan, I think, getting a little too picky. Well, you uh, have one like that. Don't you have a money market? Yeah, CD? Not, not versus treasury bonds. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> versus CDs because it also has income. But the treasury okay. bonds, you know, I always tell people that's preservation of capital, uh, you know, but you're absolutely right. right. There is a interest rate risk. And how do we mitigate that, Dean? Uh, um, well, a ladder bond portfolio. If you're taking yeah. 60, what are you taking, Catherine? Are you taking 66? She's 66, yeah. I so a ladder bond portfolio would be an, an answer available to us as well. Yeah. So I think that's legit. I don't think, you know, if you tell me you missed your 66 because of the difference between a money market and a treasury bond, I might say, eh, not so sure. Catherine has another one. Uh, is Regulation D the only thing that is exempt from both federal and state? The answer is no. There are other safe harbors under 33 but also would be safe harbors under the Uniform Securities Act. I don't think you'll get tested on them, but I would not need to register a Reg A as well with the state. So, uh, Brian, what do you think? Yeah, I don't think it's a test. Uh, yeah, for the 66, they're not going. That's a, that's way into the 37. And the persons she has listed under there, remember, Reg D is for an exemption of securities. Yes. Not persons. Yeah, persons, the exemption, Kath, would be like if you're an issuer, working for an issuer, you're not receiving compensation. Um, the other thing I would tell you, I think the one that's tricky, Catherine, is not the Reg D or Reg A, but Rule 147. An interstate offering is exempt under 33, but not the Uniform Securities Act. So I wouldn't have to register an interstate offering with the SEC, but I would have to register an interstate offering with the state administrator. So I think that's pretty much that. Ken or Louisiana, I'm Marcel. I always tell mom, you said hi. Oh, you're kind of one of her favorites. <laughs> you know, you know you, it's easy to become the mom's favorite. Take her out to dinner, buy her some dinner. And, uh, you know, Marcel bought some dinner, bring us some local good coffee. And uh, I'm telling you, Marcel, my mom is a coffee fiend. I can't believe how much it costs me to keep my mom in coffee. It's crazy. <laughs> you know, I buy, I have the subscription where, you know, we already went through all the coffee. Marcel was kind enough to get us. We like nice dark coffee and community coffee is fits that bill, certainly. And, you know, I uh, <laughs> I got to, um, I'm always bumping that subscription. More beans, more beans, more beans. New Jersey, Ooh. Michelle from New Jersey in the house. Somerville, nice. Yeah, from New York City, the Big Apple. How's the weather? I hear it's pretty cold there. I just got done with a tutoring session from somebody in Morgan Stanley, New York City. He was telling me getting cold. Rachel, I'm sorry to hear your misfortune. I'm sorry the Sunday time didn't work, but let's definitely get on the phone. Let's do some debrief. Uh, I will link Rachel to my. Uh, you failed. Is it over? Podcast episode. Uh, uh, spoiler alert: It's not. Uh, I will link that. I have five recommendations. But you and let's you and I talk uh, uh, for real. You know, on Zoom and just go over that quickly. Uh, you know, and see what you know what we might want to do differently. But I know you worked hard, and I know that 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 certainly hurts. So uh, hopefully we'll get it next time. Right? We'll go get it next time. I think sometimes when you when you, you suffer that initial misfortune, sometimes it makes the victory even sweeter. Yeah. You know, I always joke where I had a broker and he took the test. You don't want to do this if you want to pass, but he took the test five times. He'd go out and say, if anybody knows this stuff, it's me. I had to take the damn test five times. And I always thought he was living proof of two things, resiliency. And then, you know, people invest with you because they like you and they trust you, not because you can pass tests. I don't know if you had that experience when we gave scores, Brian. If somebody got over 90, I felt like firing them on the spot because I'd say two things. How am I supposed to supervise you if you're smarter than me? Secondly, it doesn't lend itself well to be an, an intermediary as a very smart person. You know? So the good living is between, you know, uh, the sweet spot I found was about 80, you know, right in there. Past that, 
I had a, a, a lady who passed and she got the perfect score. She said, I go, really? This is when they were given scores. She goes, yeah, 72. Yeah. I maximized my study effort. I didn't learn any more than was required. Lots of New Yorkers joining us. All right. Uh, California, welcome, welcome. Good evening, Isaac. Uh, good evening. Boy, a few people on the East Coast, thank you for joining us. What's the 8 o'clock out there? Jeez. Uh, thoughts on FTC? Um, I used it for 66. Test is tomorrow. Well, gee, I don't think I should say anything. No. <laughs> <laughs> I think that... It's think just one. <laughs> there you go, yeah. I don't think reputable vendors are STC, Past Perfect, uh, Kaplan, Knopman right. Marks. Those are all vendors where if you miss the exam... I'm probably sharing this with you, Brian, but it drives me nuts. The most whiny people on blaming their vendors are, surprisingly enough, Series 24s. They're always blaming the vendor. By the way, whether it's STC or Kaplan or Passport, nobody has any love for their, their 24 provider. And what I think is funny is kind of hypocritical because they would never allow their rep to do that. In other words, you know, if you're a rep and you miss and you were using one of those vendors and you blame it on the vendor, that, that's not going to fly so well, you know, because... You know, we know that those vendors are okay. Uh, now that I've said that, I will say that uh, Kaplan Q Bank is certainly the best. So STC, uh, those scores reflect your success. Uh, but, you know, make sure you're not memorizing questions too late. But, I mean, you know, hopefully you know those are scores that are legit. Yeah, the scores are very big. Very good. Uh, taking 66 from Illinois. Want to give a huge shout out to Brian's test prep videos for 66. Woo -hoo. Thank you. Went through them this weekend. So helpful. Been scoring 78 to 84. 71 on Brian's test is very good because there's really strong correlation. Yeah. And you have some more time to find some more points. I, Nicole, uh, was tutoring a guy and I uh, told him to take Brian's uh, practice test Friday. He's testing Monday. He got a 65. And I said, well, had that been the real test, you would have failed. But good news, it's not. I said, do you think you can work hard over the weekend to find a few more points? And he uh, said, yes. And we found him the points and he passed on Monday. So I'm not saying if you fail... Brian's practice test, you're not going to pass. I am saying that, uh, you know, if you don't, then you better put in some more work. And if you get a good score, you can rely upon it. So, I mean, a good score on a Brian practice test is a good score. Yeah, you know, everybody, Trish, uh, sending Rachel some good vibes. Uh, you know, it happens. And, uh, you know, you just got to get uh, – I would take Rachel some time to refresh and reset. You know, so give yourself permission. While the, while the herd is fresh, I'm going to link the video, Rachel. But I would want you to get the test specifications while that uh, is fresh. I call this a hot uh, debrief because it's hot because you still are doing it. What I would do is go through each of those items and do plus zero minus as an intellectual inventory debrief with yourself. Plus means you feel like on the exam that was an area that you got over par, par being passing. Zero means it's something you thought you were at par. Now you can be guided a little bit by your score sheet. But the test specifications break that down a little more. And then it's counterintuitive, but what we're looking for is minuses. Minuses are things you feel like on this attempt, you were below par, below passing. Now, you can't just work on the things that are below par because you got to bring those to par. And you got to make sure nothing else slips. So you got to bring everything above par. What I mean by that is we want to overlearn. So next time, overlearn, we can take down any draw of the exam, regardless of whether it's a face to death draw or not. Oh my God, that hurts. One point. Well, again, I'm going to link to my little uh, episode on the podcast about uh, how to respond to that misfortune. I have five recommendations for you. Uh, I gave you one of those five and uh, you can find that in the replay in the uh, video description. Hurts. It hurts, man. I know, Brian, what do you think? I guess we could ask our test takers. Uh, what do you think in the chat? What's, what do you think is the worst miss psychologically? I sometimes think missing it by a, a wide mark makes me feel better. Because <laughs> I, I joke sometimes, I tell people, we just got to pretend that never happened. But when you miss it by one point, I go, oh, did I change an answer? Did I, you know, what was it that I, you know? I, 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 I you know what, to be honest with you, I really don't dwell on it. Because again, yeah, we either you get to pee or you don't. Now, if you don't <laughs> get to pee, what can we do to get it? There the you go, Ryan. Good you know, I always say that people that get that close is often not a conceptual problem, but it's not a knowledge deficit a problem. Taking problem. The other re reason I think, and I've shared this as well, also sponsoring broker dealers think the same. 
And that's why most broker dealers will send you again yeah. if you're in that 60, high 60 range, because they know you put in the work at some other variable. Uh, I don't know if it's still true, but when I was a practitioner, Brian, and when I hired and fired people, I would be very honest with you that if you got below 60, I'm going to let you go. Because below 60 is a knowledge deficit yeah. problem. Right. right. That means you didn't lay the base for whatever reason. Uh, took the uh, Series 7 a week ago, did not pass the first time. Lots of people, Michelle, have not passed the Series 7 the first time. So there's no, uh, you know, no uh, red mark that will follow you for the rest of your career. There are very successful people who have uh, missed the mark. What's that? The scarlet letter. Yeah, no scarlet letter involved, right? So, in fact, uh, I sometimes think that uh, your firm is interested in how people respond to misfortune of any kind. And, you know, I like to see how somebody, when they have some uh, misfortune like that, how they respond, because it says a lot about their character moving forward. I can't tell you, Michelle, how many people I've known who've never had any kind of a, a misfortune strike them. And then when they do, we find out they're paper tigers that they... They talk a big talk, but they can't take a punch, you know, uh, so, you know, from life in general. You know, I have a, a friend and, and uh, him and her, his wife, you know, he was making a lot of money and then uh, he wasn't making a lot of money. And then he just wouldn't go get a new job. <laughs> He's just sitting on the couch and, you know, she was telling me, she, you know, I don't care if he, any job would be better than no job. I just wanted to respond. <laughs> I didn't think he was going to respond by, you know, stay on the couch all day long. Get back up. Get back into the fight, right? Uh, Stephanie, we're sending you good test vibes. Uh, make sure you get a good night's rest if you can. Be thinking happy thoughts. Uh, you know, you got this. Uh, Stephanie, I have arranged uh, just now with FINRA to give you a dream draw tomorrow. I said to FINRA, will you send Stephanie all the things she knows and none of the things she doesn't? And they have agreed to do so. So dream draw for you tomorrow. Uh, I should say I'm teasing because I, I have people who call FINRA and say I'm Telling people I can arrange draws. I was going to say, they didn't answer your email, did they? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, hey, I told you, whenever you're ready, man, I owe you an hour. So not a, not a problem, my friend. Just let me know. We'll make it happen. I don't know when your test date is now. Uh, you know, I always joke too, Brian, if you're a top producer, your firm is a little more forgiving because they know you're, you know, I had a person I was working with and, you know, there's no way she's going to lose her job because he brings in too much money. Right? So with her, it was much different. Oh, just no problem. Go try it again. <laughs> so, so, Marcel, when you're ready, you just let me know. Vanguard. All right. Scottsdale flow. Wow. Uh, Vanguard has the uh, the mess there. You know, Vanguard has that whole nautical theme. Uh, they have great breakfast burritos. And uh, literally in the Vanguard campus in Scottsdale. I was I used to go all over. I have a Vanguard ID badge, so boy, it's harder to get a Vanguard ID badge than it is to you know get a U four. Dude, dude, I had a Vanguard. Yeah, dude, dude, yeah. Gosh, anyway, dude. so before I had the badge, I would really have to escort you yeah. from building to building, and I said, "This is ridiculous." I said, "I'm going over to get a breakfast burrito, and I'll be back." You can actually see me on your camera go from here to there because they only had one guard, and so I was I just lost. It. I said, "So are you telling me I'm under arrest?" You're telling me that I cannot leave this building. He goes, whoa, you know. And then I said, okay, well, I'm going to leave the building and we'll go from there. But anyways, uh, the senior person at Vanguard said, well, Dina, you know, we apologize, whatever. I go, well, it's not a big deal. But, you know, I could have been like some public and client employment retirement system guy, a trillion dollars, and this guy's, you know, uh, being rude. <laughs> so, I love going like, out there because if you recall, they used to hire us after the tax season. Yeah. Yeah, we would be in Scottsdale between May and September, the hottest times of the year. I was teaching on a Saturday in Vanguard and uh, I went to Arizona State, Flo, and I showed up in Bergen stocks and sandals and uh, well, Bergen stocks and shorts. And one of the corporate trainers at Vanguard said, Dean, we can't have you walking around the campus in Bergen stocks and, and shorts. I mean, you know, people might think you're one of us and you're a corporate trainer. And, and he said, well, what do you think the dress should be? And I said, well, I have uh, my dress code is the less competent you are, the more formally you should be dressed. Yeah. Was, and he kind of looked at me and looked at him and he goes, well, are you talking about me? I said, well, if the shoe fits. <laughs> I'm taking the SIE test on Monday. All right. Catlin Cubank. Listening to practice text explications. All right. And other videos. Any suggestions? I think you're doing exactly what you need to be doing. So, uh, Benita, uh, what are you scoring on those practice tests? Uh, I would like you to be in the mid-70s on those uh, explications. So what you do is hit pause, answer, hit play. Uh, you can buy Brian's just – I don't know why people don't understand this. 
If you just want Brian's practice exact, period, full stop, 20 bucks. I think it's still 20 with the discount. Yeah, something like that. So yeah, close. And you can have that PDF in physical form uh, to do as well. So I like what you're doing. I'd like to know what your scores are. And uh, from that, I could give you a little better, you know, uh, idea. I got a question that said there were four bonds that mature one, two, five, 10, 25 years or something like that. That's five. And I think it was what duration is only five days ago, but can't recall much. Well, duration, I don't know. They're probably oversimplifying this, but Rachel, when I think of duration, I just think it's the fancy word for volatility. What I mean by that is just like your series seven, long and low, baby, right? Long and low. So in terms of volatility, we look at the longest maturity first, and then we look at the lowest coupon. So the bond that has the longest maturity here, it says 25 years, and the lowest coupon would be the one that has the highest volatility or longer duration, higher duration. Uh, so that's how you answer that question. Uh, it's not a linear relationship. It, it's, you know, the word for it has convexity. I don't think you're going to worry about that on the test. Uh, but uh, here's Brian's board. What do you got on the board there, Brian? It's, uh, it looks like you need uh, some measure, uh, measure of bond volatility. Just okay. to you, definitely... got, you got your, uh, looks like you need to get some new pins there, or you got, uh, oh, God. Yeah, you, got a little white, you got a reflection off the whiteboard too. So, but yeah. no big deal. No big deal. Yeah. Yeah. So that's how I would have answered that, Rachel. I would have gone for the 25 year bond. And then uh, I would look at the coupon if there's a tie. The tiebreaker would be the coupon. By the way, that I means the zero coupon, right? A 25 year zero would be it because there's no, you know, the income stream on a bond acts as a stabilizer on the price in terms of, you know, somebody will buy it to capture that yield. So that would be anything else on duration? I, think that's I, I, I want to throw this out to the universe. Okay. You know, we talked about this on episode two of. Yeah, we got an episode up, Rachel, on, uh, on this very. I don't know if you had a chance to watch our episode. Yeah. When people hear the word duration, they think of length of time, right? They think it's maturity. And so I always tell people duration is not about maturity. It's about coupon rate because just what you just said, right? That's the great stabilizer. If the coupon rate is too low, duration then is too long and the bond gets all volatile. Yeah, so I like it. When you see duration, the first thing I'm looking at is coupon rate. Okay. Well, I, I tack it the other way. I go for maturity first, then coupon. But, you know, uh, uh, Rachel, a question, a question. So hopefully you didn't miss my one. Cynthia. Hey, Cynthia. Well, hey, welcome back. We got to come up with some badges or something for Marcel and Cynthia, you know, our regulars, regulars. Who will, uh, Cynthia uh, smashed my municipal bond quiz the other day. Oh, she but smashed it? I love it. Smashed. You know why, Brian? Because she has a tutor. <laughs> there you go. I'm teasing. I'm teasing. <laughs> I listen. We understand that people are not monogamous about their study. You know, whoever can help you get your mark, that's who you're going to use. So, uh, Brian and I do. Yeah, the P. Uh, Brian and I do uh, end up tutoring some of the same people. Be careful you don't get too many different voices. Like you just heard Brian and I disagree about how to attack a duration plan, but you know, a duration question. But you know, for pretty much we're on the same page. You don't want to get two tutors that are you know, completely different in their approach and how they do things. Pick one or the other. I'm not saying those tutors aren't good. I'm just saying you don't want to have too many voices in your head that conflict, you know. Um, I've heard some horror stories, Brian. I have a young lady uh, testing tomorrow. Uh, I think she's going to get her P for sure. Worked really hard. Farsi charged her $4,000. Can you uh, Don't even money? bring them up. I don't want to say bad things to them. Okay. I mean, man, crazy. Uh, and then... And then the biggest sin I think you can commit, she said that they destroyed her, the guy who was her tutor, Varsity, destroyed her confidence. I hear oh, it all. Man. You know, crazy. Uh, one reason on my channel, I don't let you buy like a bulk 10 hours is because, you know, I think at the initial hour, you're going to decide whether you like me and I like you. And if, if it's not a match, we can move on. <laughs> Whereas Varsity front load it and make you pay like some enormous amount. The sad part, too, is I don't think you could really get a good tutor in this regard. I mean, I'm sure maybe there's some good people there. But, you know, most of that money doesn't go to the tutor. So I would wonder what kind of tutor you are if you're you're compelled to work under that kind of an arrangement. Uh, question for Jerry Seven. What will appreciate more? Well, there we go. This is the opposite kind of question, right? So a 20-year callable bond at 10 years. 
uh, 15 year non callable, 10 year non callable, five years. So, non callable is an advantage to you, the bondholder. And so that means if interest rates are rising, well, the call provision doesn't even matter if interest rates are exactly. rising. Exactly. Right? So what we'll appreciate most when interest rates rise. Right. I don't I think we Michelle, I'm not sure we have this question correct because none of those are going to rise. You know, if interest well, rates rise, all of those bonds are going down. Right. Some bonds are going down less than others, and that would be the five year bonds. So I'm not quite sure you have that in the uh, in the queue there correctly. Brian, do you read this differently than I'm reading this? What what will appreciate most when interest rates rise? The only thing I think that would go up. None of them are going to appreciate. Yeah, no, no. I think the no. only thing I could think of that would go up would be a yield based uh, call contract that would go up as interest rates go up. Other than that, remember it's yeah. an inverse relationship. It's got to be the other way around. Yeah, if it, if it's go down because that's when the call features then come into to play yeah. when interest rates go down. Okay, what would affect working capital? So let's first talk let's talk what is working capital. Working capital, Trish, is current assets minus current liabilities, right? So what will affect uh, working capital is something that would affect your current assets or your current liabilities. So, for example, Dean has a lot of current assets. I have a lot of cash. I just spent $60,000 building a cabin. So what was the effect on Dean's working capital if I turned $60,000 into cash into a long-term asset called the cabin? My working capital is going to fall, right? So on the current asset side, if, uh, you know, I got in a check, I got a royalty check that came in for about $10,000, that causes my current assets to go up and my working capital to go up. Now, as it relates to a corporation, and I'll let Brian uh, add, add this. I see he's already ahead of me. Uh, be careful on what you're being asked. But when a company declares a dividend, I'll just give Brian his board space there, that becomes a current liability. Right. And so declaring the dividend would cause the working capital to fall. And that's why the board, before they declare it, would say to the chief financial officer, how much liquidity do we need in the business? Now, be careful, Trish, if I ask you what's the effect on paying the dividend. That's right. So, to ask a question, on the declared date, working capital is going to fall. And on the payable date, there is no effect because you have less of a current asset called cash, but you also got less liabilities. I think the balance sheet trade, I always think of my personal situation, right? Paying my bill does not affect my working capital because I have less of a current asset, but I also have less of a current liability. We are That's getting it. It's, it's got to be an event that affects one and not the other. There you go. There you go. I like it. Um, you, we do get some reverb. I think we'll fix that on our when we go backstage. It'll fix our reverb. We're getting a little reverb. Oh, Marcel, you don't have to keep mom in a coffee. Trust me. Don't don't even do that, Marcel. You you don't know. It's gonna cost you a fortune. <laughs> I'll take care of keeping mom in there with her coffee beans. Uh, Trish, I don't know if you're taking sixty six or seven. One more comment. Uh, balance sheet stuff is way more testable on sixty five, sixty six that it is on seven. Don't get me wrong. You could get a balance sheet question on like this on series seven, but uh, more testable on the NAS exams. Do you think, Brian? Uh, yes. Yeah. The seven, it seems to vary. There's a lot of standard deviation in the number of balance sheet questions on the seven. Could be one or two, could be three or four. Yeah. It, it, it varies. Depends on your draw. Yeah. Uh, Gold Balls TV, but it says Benita should take the Fenway practice exam. Absolutely. Now, Benita, if you haven't taken the FINRA practice exam, it's on their website. Uh, I have a very popular uh, video where you can watch me take that exam, hit pause, hit play, and I not only take it with you, I then tell you why the wrong answers are wrong, what the right answers are, uh, what the wrong answer was, and right answers to a different question. I'll tell you what, what at 2907, Benita, I will link to the uh, video of me taking that FINRA practice exam. And explicating. And then after I did that, I also, uh, Benita, made my own doppelganger of the FINRA practice exam. So what I did is took the answer sets from that exam, same answer sets, but then changed the questions. So it's the same kind of idea. So we have those two there. I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll just link to all of our practice exams for the SIE. Uh, those are two. And I agree with uh, Gold Bottle TV that you should do that. I also have Brian's Test Geek SIE practice exam. I got a couple of Kaplan 
uh, practice exams. So I'll link to the, all those exams uh, for you. Uh, taking the test tomorrow. Okay, well, make sure you get a good night's rest. Be happy and happy thoughts. You know, good night. Be, yeah, good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Sweet dreams. Uh, Pastor Seven, kudos. Victorious test taker in the house. The big so P. If you have any Series 7 questions, I don't know why you would want to not listen to Brian and Dean, but you can. Uh, if you don't believe us, you can ask Nicole, and she can either verify or deny uh, what Brian and I tell you. Uh, about being a test taker. <laughs> Thanks, uh, Nicole, for uh, joining us. I got to figure out how to. Um, I think I can give like little emoji badges to people that uh, put like certain comments in there. I'll see Nicole if I can figure out how to put a little something. You're not going to hand out coffee cups or t shirts? <laughs> uh, I'm going to have uh, Marcel send everybody community coffee. <laughs> there you go. Eric, uh, Merry Christmas. I think it is Christmas. I got my, you see my reindeer in the background? I got my reindeer. I got my. Christmas tree. I got on my Christmas hat uh, next week. Yeah, and, uh, you know who might show up next week? The Grinch. Da, da, da. You're a cruel one, Mr. Grinch. You're a cold and cruel man. All right. What else? I'm sorry. I get a carry away. It's been a long day. I tell him, Brian, I've almost tutored for the, I'm calling it the cycle. You know, I've tutored wow. today and over the week seven. 9, 10, 24, 28. <laughs> you know, so. What happened? Oh, well, thank you, Nicole. We try. Not everybody appreciates, appreciates us, but we appreciate those who do. <laughs> Mutual Admiration Society. I don't think Nicole Andrew, I didn't, I, maybe I missed it. I don't think she needs good luck. Didn't she tell us she passed? Yeah. I think she passed, but maybe, maybe you mean for her 66. Uh, you know, that would be, uh, are you taking, Nicole, uh, the 66 next or 63? Um, Nicole's from Maryland. Uh, 66, Ivy. Well, hi, Ivy. Ivy is one of our regulars from Rockford, Illinois. Uh, well, I'm with you, man. It's, uh, I've been very blessed this year, but uh, some years have been tough. So uh, my condolences, uh, but it's nice to get a victory, testing victory. Uh, could you go over options hedging when there is a short sale? Well, I, it doesn't lend itself well to the live stream, Calvin, but I will. I'll tell you what I will link to. I will link to a little video I have on that, and I'll briefly try and go over it and let Brian add to that. So yeah, the way I say is don't be a dumb bear. So, Calvin, a dumb bear is somebody who does something that has unlimited risk. And when you're short the stock, you have unlimited risk. And so you should certainly mitigate that risk to either entering a buy stop order, two arrows in our quiver, that's one, where I say, Calvin, if the stock, I'll just use the one I used today, Calvin, uh, I was uh, tutoring and I said, let's short a thousand shares of SeaWorld. Now, I think it's uh, terrible what they do to those orcas, pinning them up and, you know, not letting them live free there in Brian's neighborhood in the Northwest. That's where they should be you now as a, a pot. Anyway, so I call my broker and I say, I want to borrow a thousand shares of SeaWorld. Whether I want to borrow money or borrow securities, I need a margin account. Right? So first thing we have is a locate requirement. Uh, my broker dealer says, Dean, we're going to contact stock loan and see if perhaps we have a customer who signed the loan consent form. And if so, you can uh, borrow it and sell it short. Now, Daniel Drew, legendary Wall Street speculator, said those that sell what isn't his and must eventually buy it back or go to prison. So what I'm hoping is the stock is going to go down. But if I'm wrong, hedging is always about I'm, when I'm wrong. And hedging means we're going to buy for protection. And what I'm afraid of is the stock is going to go up and there's no ceiling. So what I want to do is put in a ceiling. I'm going to do some construction. Construction costs money. I'm going to buy a call. And so buying the call is the proper answer. I don't think, Brian, I'm going to turn over to Brian and his whiteboard in a sec that you would ever short the put because it's just stupid. Yeah. Because the short put, you're still exposed to unlimited risk. We have all kinds of people, Brian, who are teaching people that an uh, income strategy and in short stock is to sell a put, which is asinine. Yeah. yeah. Right? Your comments, Brian? Absolutely. Uh, I think the e there's two things, two comments I have. Uh, this is 65, right? Yeah. Uh, you yeah. will get a hedge question on the 65, most likely high probability. Seven for sure. Yeah but 99 out of a hundred times, it's going to be the long stock and not the short one. Yeah. The yeah. short stock is, is the text publishers practice questions. Right. However, having said that, 
For short stock, very simple. You buy the call option if you want to protect or hedge the stock position. And as Dean said, theoretically, we would sell the put for income, but in the re reality, that never happens. So almost, again, 99 out of 100 times, if you're hedging short stock, you're going to be buying the call. And again, if you want to look at the long stock very quickly, just the opposite, buy the put for protection and sell the call for income. You know, be careful. Brian and I are both using, he calls it, I forget what you call it. I call it the options matrix. You call it the beauty chart. Options or, aerobics. Uh, options aerobics. So, you know, uh, yeah. Well, so I will link to the video, yeah. Calvin, and I kind of like that, right? You got two types of contracts, calls and puts. You can either buy them or sell them. So all those quadrants are somehow related. And, uh, you know, I'm with Brian here. Uh, the covered call, I don't think you'll see on 65, but you will see edging. Edging means you have a stock position and stock always dominates. So in this format, I think that's a pretty good job for the live stream. Uh, next year, Calvin, I will be doing the live stream overtime sessions again. I haven't done them lately because I've been too busy, but I'll be putting up some evening classes and I'll also be putting up uh, some live stream overtimes and some office hours. And that would be a, a format where we could actually put some numbers to this, show it to you. In the meantime, I'll put up a video. Uh, Brian, by the way, did one of our evening classes on definition of registration to persons. It's been very, very popular. And so uh, I'll put that there for you if you're taking 63, 65, I'll put a link. And then the other thing I would say is that, uh, uh, tell me what you want is an evening class uh, next uh, quarter. If you're whatever exam you're taking, uh, just, you know, uh, send me an email, Dean, the series seven guru at gmail.com. Tell me what uh, test you're taking, what kind of content you'd like to see in the evenings, Brian? Yeah, this works on the 7, the 65, the yep. 66, because hedges on all of them. Oh, and Absolutely. the SIE. Absolutely. The hedge question on the SIE as well. So, uh, Reverse stock splits. Uh, I think, uh, Brian and I both believe, Andrew, that you can do a trick. Are you, are you going to your whiteboard again, Brian? Here we go. Yeah. Let's okay, keep going. okay. Let's put you back up. So uh, reverse splits. I'm going to tell you first, Andrew, my trick about splits in general. And what I mean is I always look for an answer that has in a regular split more shares at a lower price. Right. And almost always there's only one answer that has more shares at a lower price. At a reverse split, I'm looking for less shares at a higher price, which is the whole point of a reverse split. And usually there's only going to be one answer. So you really don't have to do the math if you choose not to. Uh, do you think they should do the math or just use the trick? I, uh, I Again, I don't. Use the math. I don't need to because you're absolutely right. Every test I have taken, SIE, 7, 65, 66, 24, any reverse split or regular stock split, there's always only one answer that fits the parameters. So that's you that's have to exactly right. And I tell people they're testing your concepts, not your math skills. Yeah, absolutely. Embarrassing, though, Andrew, I call this the dead cat bounce. I mean, this is really... Uh, not good news if they do a reverse split. You know, GE did a nine for one reverse right. to avoid getting delisted from the New York. Exactly. So if our stock is under a buck for more than, uh, what is it, 90 days or 100 days? I think 100 days, Brian. But anyways, we're going to get delisted, and the easy way to fix it is to do a reverse split, right? And we go from one to nine, you know. AIG did it in 2008 yeah. during the Great yeah. Recession. Yeah. Yeah, it's not good news. Not good news. Uh, series seven question from Michelle. If you're given the conversion ratio, the conversion price. Well, I would say you 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 don't need to be given both. If I could give you either one of those and you should be able to solve for. What I mean by that is I give you conversion ratio, you should be able to solve for conversion price or vice versa. But anyways, let's go on with the question. Wow. And the cost of common stock, how do you find the conversion premium? Now, this is another one, Brian, that you and I do a little wow. differently. Um, yes. I don't think the conversion premium, what I would do is, Michelle, I'll defer to Brian. I would calculate parity. That's right. And then if let's say I calculate parity and parity, well, I'll just give you an example. Let's say it's a $50 stock and the conversion ratio is a 25. So I'm taking 50 times 25. Parity on that bond is 1250. So Michelle, if the bond was trading at 1300, the conversion premium would be $50. So that's how I would go about that. Brian, how about you? Yeah, you're absolutely right. You know, you and I are simpatico in so many different things, uh -huh. right? But this ain't one of them. Yeah, I've got the easiest way to do it. Uh, what did you say the conversion price was? Get to yeah, you. one more point, though, before I uh, turn over to you, Mich uh, yeah. Brian. Michelle, the other thing is you are going to have to calculate. I don't think you're going to have to come up with premium 
on That's the Series right. 7, but parity, absolutely. You can't be fumbling around with calculating parity of the bond or parity of the common. Okay, Brian, let's, I'm sorry. That's the other on. thing I was going to say. There's not going to be any question asking for conversion premium. I can, Dean, you and I can probably guess what te text publisher did this question, right? I think Pass Perfect would be my guess. That's exactly right. That's exactly <laughs> what I was thinking. So let's say the uh, the market price of the bond goes to 110. Remember, that's a percentage of par. It's $1,100. The conversion price of the stock is 50. So here's the way I always do it. The textbook gives you like three formulas to memorize on top of all the other math. So all I do is just say, hey, the bond has gone up by 10%. That means the stock price has to go up by the equal percentage to remain equivalent in value. In other words, the parity price. So 10% of 50 is five bucks. Obviously parity is 55. I don't have math. I don't have division. I don't have calculators. I just take percentage change. And wow. just like Dean said, it's all you have to do is determine parity, not conversion premium. So if the stock price, let's say, is at 57, that would be a $2 above parity. That's a $2 premium. Yeah. I think that's where that comes from. Michelle, the other thing I would suggest is two things. I'm going to link in the video replay to uh, a lecture I do on convertibles. And then remember in this channel search bar, you can put on the YouTube channel that you're watching, assuming you're joining us from YouTube, where you're joining us from, I think YouTube, you can put in the channel search bar parity, and then you can watch me do five, six, eight, nine, I don't know, 10 of these practice questions, uh, primarily from Kaplan. So uh, two things, I'm gonna link to a lecture on convertible bonds for you, convertible securities, a video. And then in the channel search bar, you can do that right now, just go to the channel search bar, put in parity, and poof, you know, you'll have a dozen different versions of this. And then the other thing, Michelle, is be uh, aware of forced conversion. Yes. Forced conversion is definitely on the seven. And forced conversion is when it's a, a choice you have to make to convert because the call price is less than what you'd make converting. So that's called forced conversion. And you will get a question on forced conversion. A callable convertible bond. That's where the... Right on. Uh, forced conversion comes in. Right Here's a spoiler alert. Always pick convert as the answer choice. <laughs> uh, Rachel, say thanks, Trisha. You know, hey, you know, when you're, listen, I know, I think it's so much harder, Rachel, to, to take the test nowadays than it used to be. I know we have somebody who's joining us. I don't know if the Vanguard crew members are back on campus, but whether you're a Schwabi or a crew person, or fidelity, you know, we used to be on corporate campuses. There was a cohort. And if somebody was having a bad day, we could go get a breakfast burrito if it's in the morning or adult beverage in the evening, buck you up and they say, hey, you know, it'll be better tomorrow. And now it's harder when you're doing this by yourself. And one of the things, uh, you know, that I like about our Tuesday is we're here for each other. And so uh, I would, you know, I think it, I'm, you know, obviously I think you should be here, but it's nice to be, uh, with birds of a feather that are flocking together that, you know, we all have a similar kind of thing we're trying to do. Brian and I are trying to help you get across that mark to get that P. So please do continue to be plugged in. Uh, Rachel, uh, uh, I love that Trisha is sending you that positive uh, vibe. Good testing vibes here on a Tuesday. Uh, I have somebody test tomorrow. I told you, and boy, I told her first the Hippocratic oath. We do no harm is a, you know, I can't prevent you from booking a tutoring session the day before your exam, even though I don't prefer to do that. Uh, best way to memorize BD agent. <laughs> you want that one, Brian? Coach B? Uh, send me an email. I'll give you the cheat sheet and 11 practice questions. All right. Let me put up uh, Brian's It will change uh, email. Me. He has a, I don't like that he calls it a cheat sheet. He knows I don't like that. But the reason I don't like it is I'm afraid, coach, that somebody's going to leave this Brian's thing at the exam site that is called cheat sheet. Uh, I guess I shouldn't worry about it because they'll come after Brian. <laughs> but, but Brian does, there's his email. Now, is that offer good just to the coach or is that good for everybody? No, it's everybody. As a matter of fact, I, I get emails almost, well, probably every other day on, yeah, that, yeah. on that cheat sheet. So what Brian has, he calls it his cheat sheet. I really like what I use a coach for is you can actually put yourself in his little box that I call buckets. He's got these, and they're not buckets really, but I mean, they're, you know, he's got the BD, then he's got the agent of the BD. He's got the IA and the IAR. And what I do is I, Brian, have my 2D put them in the box. Their firm, themselves, where do they think they're in that box, that little cheat sheet? 
Yeah. And then we use that to kind of uh, riff on that. If you email me, Coach, uh, put in, you know, I'm sure it's under a different email than Coach B. But <laughs> please uh, put in parentheses Coach B so that I know it's you. Okay, cool. Yeah, Brian, giving his stuff away. Pretty soon, he's going to just uh, remove the password protection on te Teachable. And <laughs> yeah, you'll be able to get, you know, all the stuff for free. I'm teasing. Uh, let's see. Uh, I'm sorry. If I'm behind, uh, be patient. There's Coach B. Coach B. Where do you go, Coach B? Benita, we did that. Yeah, now we did that one already. There's Eric. Uh, okay, I'm just trying to find where right. this thing. Is. Michelle Janice is next. There's Coach B. Thank you. Uh, question: Are you? We did that one. We did that one already, did we not? Um, sorry. Caesar in the house. Caesar, greetings and salutations, Caesar. Before I could uh, retake my seven, my firm, First Command, are no longer requiring new RRs. Yes. You I take the SIE, the seven and sixty-six, but instead, well. That makes it uh, more approachable, I think, for some folks. Um, oh, man. So there, before you could retake the seven. So are they saying you can't retake the seven? You must go down the road of SIE 666? No, it's 66, I believe. It's six. I work very closely. Oh, with yeah, there you go. I think, Caesar. yeah, 66 doesn't do you any good with a six. So no. I got some bad news for you. I think that's a 6365. So your uh, testing journey is now going to have four legs instead of three. Uh, I would say, Caesar, if first command will go for it, uh, I would uh, want you to, I would try and stick to my, the road I'm already on, which is SIE 766. But if you can't, I mean, you know, that's, you know, first command has a lot of military folks, former military folks like myself, you know, Marines and, you know, it, you know, it is what it is, right? The Marine Corps wants you to do something like I, I, right. But uh, I would try and stay with a 766 uh, if you can. Uh, hi, Dean and Brian. Yes. Taking the 65 next week and confused about inflation. <laughs> well, Selma, that's because Dean is trying to t teach how to pass the test. So, Selma, your, your definition of inflation is Dean's definition. Too much money chasing too few goods. So that's my definition, too. Well, there you go. And then Kaplan, this is a guy named Chuck Lowenstein. I love Chuck, but I do too. Brian doesn't love Chuck as much as I do. I do. I do. I like Chuck. <laughs> the decrease in monetary units. So I'm sure that's, a, I'm pretty sure, Selma, that is the Kaplan definition, uh, according to Chuck Lowenstein. Now, I would tell you, Selma, it doesn't really matter. This is like a theological argument of how many angels are dancing on a head pin. But, but in the test, neither one of those things is really, you know, what the test is about. Uh, what the test is going to be about is the measurement of inflation, which is the consumer price index. And then how do you deal with inflation in portfolio construction? The idea of purchasing power risk. And you should know that fixed income uh, investments are going to do well in an inflationary environment. And you should know that we have things that do keep pace with inflation called tips. And then over the long term, common stocks have beat inflation. Uh, Brian, what do you want to add to this? Selma's point about these two definitions. I, I, I have, especially for the Series 65, um, I have this progression, this little graph, graphic, uh, where the Fed, because of inflation, which is too much money in the system, would then start selling treasuries to take money away from banks. Right. So the money supply goes down. And that's exactly what I think Chuck is saying. Uh, he went a couple of ste steps ahead. When there's inflation, there's generally a decrease in the money supply. Which well, the Fed right now, you're telling me you're living in the real world of this, right? The Fed has been very honest that they're trying to dent demand. Right. Right. They think there's too much money chasing too few goods. A lot of it was fiscal stimulus. You know, the government was spending fiscal policies very tested. That's government spending and uh, taxation. Yeah, Brian's disagreeing with me, but I'm with him. No, I'm not disagreeing. Well, Lawrence yeah. Summers is with Dean. So anytime I got Lawrence Summers agreeing with me, I, I'm feeling pretty good. Uh, but anyways, then it would be the next point is about tools of the Fed to fight inflation. So, or by the way, to stimulate demand, either one, right, depending on what we're trying to do. And so the, the one that comes up a lot in the test is open market, market operations. So Brian's point right now, the Fed has been, uh, selling or letting bonds mature. They haven't been buying any more bonds. 
Right. And the effect of that is it contracts the money supply, causing interest rates to go up, right? And the money supply to go down. Right. And the value of the dollar. Yep. And then that's right. towards the uh, I do think that's testable, but I don't think some of you need to worry about being confused about whether it's Dean's definition or Kaplan's definition. It's rather the questions that follow from that, right? So, so. Uh, those are great scores, Benita. I like it. I asked you. To, I asked her to tell us her marks, Brian. Those wow. are good marks. Those yes, are good marks. Are. Yes, they are. Oh man, Nicole, bless you, because you know Brian doesn't think you need to do ninety percent of the QBAC. Dean does. Yeah. We're on different sides tonight. What is this all about, man? <laughs> I'm honoring. No, I'm, I'm joking. Um, again, it's okay to differ on things, but uh, I would just tell you, if I were your accountability partner and I have an admin key, an admin key meaning I can go backstage and see what you're doing activity-wise. I can't, I can't see watching videos or reading the book. What I can see is how many practice questions you're doing. And when somebody doesn't pass and we look at the admin key, one thing they have in common is low QBank usage. So that's why I'm such a stickler. We're saying now, Brian, I think has a good point. What is it, Brian? You think if you're getting 70 or 75, move on? No, no. What, it's, not about scores. it's not about, especially on those large customized yeah. quizzes. I just think that. 20 to 30% of those questions are superfluous. They're above yeah. and beyond the test. And I don't want people trying to stuff something in there. Yeah, that, I got to say, right? I queued up a practice yeah. custom quiz today in a tutoring session. And your point, Brian, I was really disappointed that <laughs> the customized quiz put up a lot of time where I, where I was finding myself saying, oh, don't worry about that. Don't worry about that. <laughs> you know, oh, there's a good one. Right. So there's a certain. There well, you know, a certain where that line right. is, I don't know. Is it 1,500 questions? Is it 2,000 questions? I don't know where that line is. But Nicole, what I, we both agree on is the Kaplan Q Bank is the Absolutely. best. And the re reason we think that is because of the customizable part of it. It's way more uh, a Q Bank that can be manipulated to your benefit. And the huge thing that Kaplan has is the performance tracker, yes. where you can actually see what areas you're weak in and, and remediate on those areas without trying to you know remediate everything. Uh, I'm agnostic. I tutor people who have Pass Perfect, STC. You know, uh, Solomon, you name it. I've seen it. I tutor with it. And that's the one thing that I do think is that Kaplan's QBank uh, is the strongest of all the QBanks out there. Uh, in, in modern portfolio strong. I, there's not Edward strong modern portfolio theory. There's strong uh, versions of the efficient market hypothesis. So some of the questions gave me some issues. I think Edward did. Uh, it looks like that's easily fixed. So modern portfolio theory is not part of strong. Strong is part of the efficient market hypothesis. Inflation rate on bonds, IA lending money, IAs uh, cannot lend money. That's right, you know, lending institutions. So those are all separate things. So are you gonna give that a shot on the whiteboard there, Brian? No, I was just gonna show them a little graphic that there's three of those market theories on series 65 and 66, all right, cap M, efficient market hypothesis and modern portfolio theory and the weak semi strong and strong belong with the efficient market hypothesis yeah. not modern portfolio theory yeah modern That's portfolio cool. theory edward is that stuff about negative correlation you know uh the efficient uh, frontier you know that kind of stuff do you have a practice quiz on municipal bonds specifically i think majority of my series seven was municipal bonds. do you have one brian I do. I have a seven. just on minis. Yeah. Oh, I didn't know that. No. So, are you volunteering that to Michelle? Do I am you? volunteering. All right. Well, there you go. So, man, Brian is in the gift Christmas mood today. Man, he's like crazy Eddie. You're giving away the store. <laughs> well, that's uh. There you go. Yeah. And then remember, you can do a customized quiz of munis too on your Kaplan QBank, assuming you have a Kaplan QBank. Right. If you don't have a Kaplan QBank, you can get one for the Series Seven. With my 20% discount code at checkout, it's $58.50. And then you can create, you know, custom custom quizzes. All right. Well, whoop, I'm sorry. Well, let me get back to our comments. What would your advice be? And then that's 63. There we go. 
Uh, two favorites. Well, thank you, Cynthia. Yeah. Doing 63 now. All right. All right. If it quadruples instead of doubles. Well, quadruple, Selma, remember halfway as a double. <laughs> so, Selma, here's the one I, I, I kind of, I'm trying to figure out right now to make this a, a more formal lecture. So, Selma, I don't know if you've seen the one I do. Here's the one I do. You have a customer who's 50 years old. He has $100,000. He wants to retire at 70. 20 years is the time horizon with $400,000. So, Selma, that is the quadruple, right? Now, if you look at that and you say, okay, so our financial journey is 20 years, and we want to go from a present value of 100000 to a future value of 400000 we need to know what rate of return is necessary. And this is what I mean by inputs and outputs. So, Selma, this is up to you as a test taker, but I go, Okay, well, if I could get him to two hundred thousand dollars at age sixty, right? If I could double the hundred to two hundred at age sixty, ten years, and then I could double it again to four hundred in another ten years, that would work. And so now I can use the rule of seventy-two. I say, okay, I need to double the money in ten years. Seventy-two divided by ten years is seven point two percent. That will give me get me from the hundred to two hundred, and then I need to double again, ten years. Again, 7.2 will get me there. Now, here's what, Brian, I've been trying to do. See if this, I'm, I'm doing this on the fly, so I'm working with that here a little bit, Brian. What I've been doing when I'm using this example in a tutoring session is sometimes I say, okay, so we took the 100 to 400, and that was 7.2. And if we took, we did present value, future value, we took the future value back to present value, that 7.2 could be referred to as the internal rate of return. That makes sense so far with Brian, because here we go. Now I'm going to work without the net. Yep. So then what I do, Brian, is I get rid of the 100. I black it out. And I say, now we have a future value of 400. And we need to know what we need at age 50, 20 years, right? Going back the other way. What is 420 years from today worth? We've got the future value. We got the number of compounding periods. And we got 7.2. And that would give us that 100 grand. Is my math copacetic so far? I was going to say, you always say you're not good at math, but that was pretty good. Okay. And then, then what I do is I black out the 400. <laughs> and I say, okay, so now we have 100, and we want to know what that's going to be 20 years from today. Number of compounding periods, 20. Rate of return, 7.2, and that gets us to the 400. Uh, is that math copacetic? I don't think it's testable the way I did it, but I think it's. Co I think my math is relevant. You think math works? Yeah. All right, cool. Anyway, so I'm going to answer your original question. A quadruple is a double twice. <laughs> I feel like what is it, Rodney Dangerfield? <laughs> you know, what's that thing he does on the driving board uh, in Caddyshack, the triple Lundy? <laughs> the quadruple is the quadruple is the double uh, double twice. The quadruple. Uh, what would be your advice the next thirty days if you're going to do well, Edward? As I said, give yourself a time to refresh and reset. Come up with a new study plan. I'll link to that. Uh, you fail with my five recommendations. I would implement those. One is an intellectual inventory. I give thought to what you did this time. You're going to do different next time. Uh, what do you think, Brian, in terms of a new study plan? Yeah, for 30 days. Uh, I would look at the uh, test scores from the previous exam, find my weak area, start there. There you go. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, can I go to your channel to watch you explain questions? Sure, absolutely, Benita. So I told you I'm going to link to the practice exams. There's all kinds of practice exams you can watch on all the exams. Uh, with explanation. So, oh, can I show you? Uh, why don't, uh, if you just go to the YouTube channel and you go to the playlist, it's on the front page, the home page. It's the third, uh, second playlist down. So if uh, I'm, I don't, Benita, want to shut this down because I might accidentally, you know, kick myself out of the, the live stream. But uh, I'll tell you what, send me an email. My turn to offer free. Brian's, now Brian, see, Brian's giving away stuff. Now Dean's got to give away stuff. So send me an email, Benita, and just in the heading, uh, tell me that you're looking for the practice exam playlist, and I'll send you the link in an email. And there you go. Now I've done uh, giving away something, too. There you go. <laughs> All right. I think we're getting close to the end. Uh, let's see where we're we at. Could you tell me? Could you all please go over uh, takedown, additional takedown, uh, I'll tell you what I do is towards the end, Sam, I'm going to link to uh, a video I have on underwriting municipals. 
And I go through that entire thing about the additional takedown, the selling concession, Eastern versus Western. And so, Sam, I will link to that video in the uh, video description. So when we're done, I'll also be need to put it in the video description. When we're done, what I do after we do the drawing is I then put all the links I promised people. And you can go back there and you can find that. And so I will link to that, Sam. Yeah, it's a great question for Series 7, by the way. Absolutely. Absolutely. You're going to get questions. I, I, have, I have content for it, too. Right, yeah. yeah. Uh, you bought uh, his material. I don't know if it was a memory aid on the 9R or something. Brian's stuff is fantastic. Oh, uh, yeah, it's great. So I guess he already has your stuff, Brian. Uh, say thank you. You're welcome. QBank is amazing. Thank you. Which exam mirrors the uh, Brian for sure, Edward? Brian for sure. There's, that's not even a, even close. Uh, hi, just passed the Series 7. Big thanks. Yes. Starting 66. All right, Sarah. No idea where to begin. Well, you got to begin at the beginning, right? Uh, I have, Sarah, a playlist. I'll link to it. It says, taking the Series 7, start here. <laughs> so I'll put that there for you, right? Now starting the 66, yeah. Uh, I didn't know how to calculate 72. Campbell makes it so complicated. Well, I actually have some, and I'll link to that as well. I have a, a whole video on the rule of 72. So I will link to that. By the way, it's not like they're going to ask you the rule of 72. It's more like, do you, can you recognize where it might be helpful to figure out something? Uh, 80s, fantastic, Francisco. You're welcome, Benita. Uh, we, I think we just talked to Sarah. Yes, we did. Thanks for joining us, Sarah, on LinkedIn. Uh, I, you know, I love when people join us from LinkedIn and Facebook. Uh, all right. Thanks, guys. You're welcome. Okay. Time for the giveaway. I need to bring up my uh, thing here, Brian. Uh, you got any ideas for our... Dude, <laughs> it's been up Noelle, there. Noelle, I like it. Now, is Noelle uh, somebody you're tooting for one of her exams? <laughs> no. So put Noelle into the uh, chat if you want to participate in the drawing. And I will go find the giveaway tool here. And yeah, let's see, share it screen. Boom. All right, there we go. Uh, can everybody see the screen? Yep, looks good. Okay, and then remember, I told you what you gotta do is, if you win, uh, send me the email uh, claiming your victory. Uh, Rachel was gifted. You can the coaching call is recorded and shared with others. You can assign it, you can share it, you can do it with it what you want. It's for any FINRA or NAS exam. It's a little more helpful if you have an agenda of what you would like to talk about, but uh, that's not necessary either. It's not a floating liability that I have to use, so you know it needs to take place in the following week. You know, paid my paid activities take you know precedence over you know free activities. So, all right, uh, are we ready? Last call. All right, here we go. Isaac, all right, Isaac is the winner. Woohoo! Woohoo! All right, everybody, we will see you next Tuesday, 5 p.m. Share with any test takers you know. Uh, remember, inch by inch, your exam is a cinch. Yard by yard, your exam is hard. And Brian, you say? Keep it simple. Stay with what you know. You take the test. Don't let the test take you. All right, everybody. We'll see you next Tuesday. Bye-bye.